Hi folks, in this video we are going to take forward our discussion on probability theory and random variables. Uh, so in the last video, I introduced you to the idea of random variables and probability theory and also to a very very important probability distribution called the Gaussian distribution. And I also mentioned that uh, Gaussian distribution is very very common and ubiquitous in real life and also very very important in machine learning. So in this video we are going to try to understand why is it that this Gaussian distribution is so common? Why is it that it occurs a lot more naturally than uh, I would say many other or any other probability distribution? So before getting into that proof which we are again going to see it very very briefly uh, let me introduce you to this idea of expectation. Now of course we all have expectations from each other. You have expectations from me, I have expectations from you and we can also have expectations from a random variable. You know, sounds interesting. So, as it turns out, all calculations that we do of random variables have to be done using their probability distributions. So, you could define expectation for a discrete time random variable also, but in this video, we are going to focus only on the continuous time part because our objective is to get to the proof of central limit theorem. So, let's say so let's say we have random variable capital X which is governed by a probability distribution given by small f of X and now let's take some function of this variable X. So let's say, say that there is some function g of X and we want to find the expected value of this function. So basically if your x was a deterministic variable then you would know the value that x will take and you just plug it into this function g of x to get its value of the function. But now because x is a random variable it is not deterministic so you don't really know what value x will take. So how do you then evaluate a function? You can't. So what you do is that you compute expectation using the distribution. So what you say is that I don't know what g of x will be because I don't know what x will be. It just keeps jumping around from here to there. But its expectation will follow this function which is given by g of x times f of x dx from minus infinity to plus infinity. So if you do this integration, that will tell you what can you expect from this function. So in the simplest case, let's say our g of x is just equal to x. So in that case, expectation of x is simply integration from minus infinity to infinity x times f of x dx and this particular expectation is denoted by mu and is the mean of this probability distribution function. So if you take a Gaussian distribution then it is this mean is one of the parameters of the Gaussian distribution as we have seen in the previous video. So this is a simple idea of expectation. Now you can find expectation of other higher order polynomials also. You can find expectation of x squared, x cubed, x uh, to the power 4 or sine of x, cos of x or whatever other function of x that you want. Now if you find the expectation of this quantity x minus mu whole square then this is what is denoted by sigma square. So the sigma square is called the variance of your distribution function and sigma by itself 
is called the standard deviation and we again saw in the previous video that the sigma and mu form very important parameters for the Gaussian distribution and the sigma actually models the width of the Gaussian distribution. So now if you take any other higher power of x and you find its expectation value that is denoted as small m n and these are the moments of the random variable capital X. Now if you want to find all these moments it's a very cumbersome process because n is a integer it can be from 0 1 2 3 up to infinity so you have infinite number of moments and if you want to find all the moments of the random variable x that will be practically impossible because you have to compute this integral infinite number of times but as it turns out you don't need to do so much hard work there is a lazy way of doing it and that is through what is called the moment generating function so this moment generating function although it does not quite work as we expect for all probability distributions but it does work for a very large set of probability distributions and so that's why it's a very useful concept still so what is this moment generating function it is this function denoted by capital M it's a function of some variable s and it is equal to integral minus infinity to plus infinity e power s times x times f of x which is the probability distribution function into d of x so in other words this is the expectation value of e power sx so those who have learned signals and systems would be reminded of that this is similar to the laplace transform of a signal so essentially that is what the moment generating function is all about and as we know our e of sx actually has a expansion using Taylor series so if you do that which I'm not going to do completely over here but I would ask you to do that so if you do that if you expand e power sx as a Taylor series what you will find is that your m of s can also be denoted as summation of n is equal to 0 to infinity mn by n factorial times s power n so now using this expression you can find out the individual moments once you know the moment generating function so you do this integration just once and then by using this summation this expression you can find the value for mn for any given n how do you do that just differentiate this function m with respect to s n number of times and substitute n equal to 0 so essentially what we have is that mn is equal to m differentiated n times as a function of 0 so this superscript of n in bracket represents derivative of capital M with respect to s n number of times and after doing that you substitute s equal to 0 so that all the other higher order terms will go to 0 and once you substitute that what will remain is just mn but it is important to remember that this series over here does not converge for all probability distribution for example there is an important kind of distribution called the log normal distribution for which this this, this actually does not work well so that uh, you know caution you have to take but otherwise this is a fairly useful result that you can use in many situations and this is what we are going to use to show that the 
Gaussian distribution is very very common in nature and also understand why that is the case. So before doing that let's find out the moment generating function for the Gaussian distribution itself and for doing that we are going to use a particular form for the Gaussian distribution which is the same distribution but when mu and sigma are taking specific values. In particular, we will take mu to be 0 and sigma to be 1. And that brings us to what is called the normal distribution. So normal distribution is nothing but the Gaussian distribution with mu is equal to 0 and sigma is equal to 1. And we are going to find the moment generating function for this normal distribution. So now this normal distribution f of x is given by 1 by root 2 pi e power minus x square by 2. And you can verify that integral of this f of x from minus infinity to infinity is indeed equal to 1 as it must be. So now let's work on the moment generating function for this quantity which is nothing but expectation of e power sx which is equal to integral minus infinity to plus infinity e power sx into 1 by root 2 pi e power minus x square by 2 dx okay cool so now what do we do now what we do is that we take this quantity inside this square and of course is 1 by root 2 pi is just a constant so it can be brought outside of the integral so this is equal to 1 by root over of 2 pi integral minus infinity to plus infinity e power minus x minus s whole square by 2 into e power s square by 2 dx. So this is the primary trick that we are using in this derivation. So now let's take this x minus s whole square and expand it you will get x square plus s square minus 2 sx. Now that x square by 2 is what you have over here. s square by 2 gets cancelled out with this term so that goes away and the sx terms is what you have over here. So this e power sx into e power minus x square by 2 has been represented in this form. Now what do we do? This e power s square by 2 is again a constant because it does not depend on x so this can also be taken out of the integral now what about this so this is just another Gaussian distribution whose mean has been shifted so this original Gaussian distribution was with zero mean we have taken that and we have shifted the mean by a quantity s so the distribution itself is not changing only its mean has been shifted. What does that mean? It implies that the integral of this quantity will again be equal to 1. So 1 by root 2, root 2 pi integral of this quantity alone over dx will be equal to 1 and so what we get is that this is nothing but e power s square by 2. So using this simple trick in the integration we have found the moment generating function of the Gaussian distribution. So now let's see what we can do with it in order to show that our Gaussian distribution is so so common in nature. Okay cool. So that theorem is known as the central limit theorem which shows the commonality and ubiquitousness of the Gaussian distribution. So this is the central limit theorem and it is one of the coolest 
theorems that I have personally come across. So what do we do? So what we do is that we take many many different random variables and we add them all together. So you have random variables x1, x2, x3 and so on up to xn and you add all of them together and you divide that by root n multiplied by sigma square where sigma square is the variance of each of these random variables and here of course as I mentioned we are assuming that all of them have zero mean but that is not a very strict restriction because you take a random variable you subtract it by its mean and it becomes a zero mean random variable and here the requirement is that each xi is i i d okay so this is very very crucial what is i i d i i d stands for independent and identically distributed what does that mean what it means is that each of these x1 x2 x3 and so on up to xn is independent meaning whatever value x1 takes is totally independent of the value that any of these other random variables may take and similarly for x3 x4 x5 and so on so they are all totally independent of each other the second assumption is that they are identically distributed meaning the probability distribution of x1 is same as the probability distribution of x2 which is same as the probability distribution of x3 and so on so this is the most important assumption that we are going to work with so now if I write the moment generating function of these random variables that will become m of xi s will be equal to 1 plus some m1 s plus m2 s square by 2 and so on and because these are all zero mean m1 is zero uh, and m2 is equal to sigma square so this is sigma square by 2 s square plus and so on so now what happens when you add different kinds of random variables so what happens is that if these random variables are independent of each other then the moment generating function of the sum of these random variables is equal to the product of the MGF of individual random variables so this again I am not going to prove explicitly but I expect you to work it out that when you take a sum of independent random variables then the moment generating function of the sum is equal to the product of the individual moment generating functions so basically what we have is that the moment generating function of y as a function of s is equal to the moment generating function of individual xi's as a function of s by root n sigma square because that is what we divided each random variable with and this whole thing to the power of n so this is something that I am leaving to you as a homework problem so now let us substitute this s by root n sigma square over here so what will happen this is one this will remain as it is when you take s square so you will have s square divided by n times sigma square now this sigma square and this sigma square will cancel out so what will remain is equal to 1 plus s square divided by 2n plus dot 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 to the power of n and when your n is very very large in the limit of n going to infinity this quantity becomes 
e power s square by 2. So now do you see why everything becomes a Gaussian? Because the MGF of Gaussian distribution is e power s square by 2 and what we found in this simple exercise is that if you take any arbitrary set of random variables as long as they are iid then their sum also has an MGF which is same as the MGF of a Gaussian and this is why Gaussians are so commonly available in nature because the moment you have many different processes happening which lead to this addition of random variables it eventually becomes a Gaussian. So let's take the room in which you are sitting and you have these uh, gas molecules which are moving around at random. So at each collision the gas molecule loses or gains some velocity at random and when you add up many of these collisions each of which happening at random in an independent manner with identical distribution the sum of all these changes eventually leads to a Gaussian like distribution and this is also the reason why many other distributions in nature are Gaussian in nature because they represent an underlying process of addition of many many different random variables which are iid in nature. So this was a very brief introduction to uh, probability theory and central limit theorem and the importance of Gaussians. In the next videos we will get little deeper into probability theory and see how we can start connecting it to machine learning and how we can use it to make predictions about real world problems. Till then stay connected.